Brought to you by JMR Rentals, professional digital cinema and broadcast equipment rentals in Brooklyn, New York. JMRNY.com. Hello and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend, where we go behind the scenes and talk to the creators of independent entertainment. I'm Jason Godby, and today we're going to recap the ninth annual Contra Film Series Grand Finale. We worked in partnership with them uh, for the series. I actually moderated a QA, and a but let's get into it. Let's talk about it. So in February, Contra Film Series went virtual for the grand finale, which celebrated the films from the previous year in 2020. An award ceremony was held at the HIO location in the Tribeca section of New York City. Festival founder Joffrey Guerrero was on hand to present the awards. The winners included, and please forgive my pronunciation, I'm going to mess up some of these names. The grand prize for Best Short Film went to Tree Line Lake, directed by Sana Ober. The Priest, directed by Michael Vukadinovich, was given the honorable mention for Best Short Film. The Right to Rest, directed by Sarah Megacy and Guillermo Roca, won the award for Best Documentary, and Best Animation went to Kite, directed by Hung Wai Wang. The honorable mention for Best Animation went to The Tattoo Torah, directed by Mark Bennett. Mark Bennett was at the Q&A, but unfortunately he didn't get to talk because he had some technical difficulties, but definitely check out that film if you get a chance. The night before the award ceremony, I had the pleasure of co-hosting a virtual Q&A with Joffrey Guerrero, featuring several of the filmmakers involved in the grand finale. To open the Q&A, I asked the filmmakers to tell us about their films and what it was like to be a part of the grand finale this year. The first up was Julian Santos with his film La Temps Perdue. La Temps Perdue is basically a film I made in NYU film school, and it's about, it's a romance between a local French woman and a British man who's just kind of traveling through Paris. Um, very pared down, very simple, shot on location in Paris, back, you know, in pre-COVID times. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we're just very happy as a team to have it be part of Katra, um, that, you know, it was nice enough being part of the initial festival that to be part of the grand finale is really great. And then the next week up we got is uh, Jose Acevedo. Uh, the film is Eagle. Yeah, I'm the writer and director of Eagle, which is a uh, dramatic film about a high school senior who um, robs a bodega the same day he finds out what score he got on his SATs and sort of how that impacts him. Um, yeah, it, it, it's so nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And and really, it's just it's so hard to feel good right now. <laughs> and uh, I feel so far away from the person who could go out and make a short film. And this makes me feel closer to that. So thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity and, and for giving me the chance to see everyone else's amazing work. Next up, we got uh, Shelly Rowe with White Ink. Hi, everyone. My name is Shelly. Uh, well, White Ink, it's a story of two really good friends. They go on a camping, camping trip, which is normally really chill and, you know, it takes a turn and they must face each other and who they are in the world. Shelly, can you also talk about your process? You were the producer on uh, White Ink, right? And you also were the lead? Yeah. Yes. Um, I think uh, casting wise, once the script was quote unquote ready, <clears throat> we reached out to several actresses and I had one in mind, like my favorite one in terms of, I just wanted her to, I've never worked with her before, but I wanted her to, to see and uh, kind of uh, work with her to see if this would work. And, and it did, she called us back right away and she was on board. It worked out really, really well for me. I think um, right now that Laura was talking about being a writer and then also being an actor, I think for me writing the piece, I had so much fun thinking, oh, I'm going to build this character and, you know, these so many layers and this is happening, but she's feeling this, but she's saying this. I'm having so much fun as a writer. And then, you know, I'm producing and I'm doing all these things. Then now comes time to, all right, now I have to work as an actor and really get into this. And yeah, I, huh. it was a lot of like, oh, I had so much fun as a writer, but then now I have to do the work. 
to actually bring it to life because I don't, I, if I don't do the work, the story won't be what it needs to be. So we did get to rehearse um, for all the scenes, for those of you that haven't seen the, the short, for all the scenes that are either in a hotel or in a cabin, those, you know, we worked through them. It was building relationship was really good. It was one day rehearsal. Thank God we rehearsed for the ones where we're hiking next to a waterfall because we had to have uh, snake wranglers because there's a lot of snakes, you know, coming to the water. And so it was a bunch of snake wranglers, people like hiding around the bushes, hiking up and down. It was very steep. So hiking up and down um, after, you know, between action and cut uh, for about six hours. So without that, I don't know, it was probably like two hours of rehearsal during that day for that piece of material. I think not that it, we wouldn't be able to pull it off, but I think it was extremely helpful that we knew exactly what the, the emotion, where we were, what was happening, and we could just got to play and really take in kind of the craziness of the environment itself. Next up, we got uh, Diego Lopez with Lament. Hi, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with Katra again. We want the audience uh, summer series last year. So we are very happy to screen again. Uh, and it's a drama thriller. It's a feature. And the story we tell about Elder, uh, he's a bankrupt hotel owner that uh, has to deal with this, the toughest moment in his life. Great, thanks so much. Uh, next up, we got uh, Chance Mulnick with um, Below. Yeah, so Below is a uh, horror short, uh, super short, about three and a half minutes. Um, and uh, it's a one-shot first-person thriller with a twist. Um, so I can't say much about the ending because of that twist, uh, but it's uh, most of it is from uh, the POV of the camera sort of looking out under a bed um, while something or someone is terrorizing it. Uh, so um, yeah, it's we shot it uh, in one day in December of 2019. Um, I finished post in February of 2020. Um, and so we were sort of lucky weirdly in that way because we, um, you know, we sort of had a, a movie ready um, when, when COVID struck. Next, we've got um, Richard Richard Raymond with A Million Eyes. A Million Eyes, it's a, it's a 25 minutes or a long short film drama about the birth of an artist, a young photographer in Atlanta and his um, journey with the help of a mentor of discovering his voice as a photographer, learning 35 mil photography and how important it is for young artists um, to have a mentor. Looks like we got John Gray. What is your film? Hi, Jason. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, my film is called Extra Innings, and it's about a um, very aggressive sports reporter who is interviewing the uh, manager of the Boston Red Sox, uh, trying to uncover secrets from his past. And we're, we're really thrilled to be part of the grand finale. I'm particularly thrilled to be in such great company. Uh, so many good films. And this is the second film I've been lucky enough to have uh, at Catcher. And we're just enjoying the hell out of it. I saw you got two characters in a self-contained spate in one location, and you guys were, you know, can you talk about that process? Sure. Well, uh, Peter Wiegert, um, I worked with Peter uh, some years ago on a feature film called White Irish Drinkers, and we became friends. And I actually wrote this film for him because um, he's just he's a wonderful actor and he's, a, he's a really just a great character. And uh, T.J. Tyne, um, I didn't know, but uh, um, a casting director friend of mine suggested him and got the script to him. And, um, you know, they also were eager to rehearse, which was great for us. And uh, we, we shot it um, pretty much in long takes. We didn't really do it in pieces. We, we kind of, we shot it like a play. And um, it, it was a little bit challenging because it was very dialogue heavy. And also um, I wanted to keep it on its feet and moving. So there was quite a bit of blocking and some you know, complicated camera stuff to work out. So it's not just two people sitting at a desk, you know, talking. Um, but, you know, these actors were just great and generous. You know, they, they really didn't get paid very much at all, as, you know, is usually the case with these short films. 
but they were very passionate about the material and wanted to do a great job and they worked really hard. And I think that Peter in particular just brought a great humanity to it because he's just, you know, he's such a wonderful actor. All right, next up we got uh, Zarina from uh, Lex Trust. Lex, tell us about your film. Uh, yeah, Zarina is a short psychological thriller about a woman who endures uh, frequent nightmares of her own death. Uh, pretty straightforward. It's really just a four minute piece that's like a dream out of a dream out of a dream um, sequence. And um, you guys filmed that, was that pre-COVID or during COVID that you filmed that? It was pre-COVID, yeah. It was actually uh, in the summer of 2019. Um, I, I participated in a filmmaking program called the Emerge Filmmaking Lab. Um, I was like one out of uh, three finalists that received a $5,000 grant to go in production of the film. And we shot it over the course of two days in July 2019. Very cool. I think, I think we've all had nightmares of our own death. <laughs> I know I have. I know I have. Otherwise, I wouldn't be making the film. So, <laughs> the award for best episodic or TV pilot went to *Man Overboard*, directed by Sam Cadman. The writer of *Man Overboard*, Neil Lerner, was there to represent the project. It's a dark comedy, and it's called *Man Overboard*, and it's about this guy Doug Mann, who in one day his life falls apart. He comes home, he gets fired for inappropriate eating at work. And then he comes home and finds his wife in bed with a couple of people that he knows. And then his mom won't let him stay with her. So he ends up living on an old boat that they grew up sailing when his dad was alive. And the series is about Doug Mann starting a new life, living on this boat in a crappy Bronx marina, uh, surrounded by a bunch of colorful characters. And, uh, and it's really about, uh, so that's the plot. And it's, it's really about um, sort of a middle-aged white guy who didn't realize he was privileged. And he finds out that he was, but he had no idea until his life fell apart. So it's, that's sort of the underlying theme of it. We came up with the idea, we'd read about people affording to live in New York City by living on boats, you know, around the city. And so we started hanging out at marinas and um, we ended up meeting all sorts of amazing people at Liberty Landing um, near Jersey City. And um, they took us in. We spent weekends on their boat with them. They all came and threw us parties and barbecues and told us all their stories. It was um, amazing. Uh, so we learned, you know, we learned like who these people were and how they live on these boats, they call liveaboards. And uh, they live full time and um, it's pretty much under the radar. And it's a very off the grid kind of crowd who's drawn to live on their boats full year round. And uh, so was, we met amazing people. W was the boat docked at the time? Were you guys on the water? The boat was docked. We found this guy who had, we were looking for the worst boat possible. We wanted a really crappy looking boat. And this one guy had been a Wall Street guy and had been very severely disabled during 9-11. And the only place he could afford to live was at the marina. And he lived in this tiny, crappy, like full of stuff boat, nicest guy. And he let us use his boat. And um, uh, I wanted to bring up one thing. I don't know if anyone else has filmed on the water before. Um, we had never done that, but we had a whole, we only, we shot in two days. And the second day of shooting was all at the marina. And we started 7 a.m. and about 3 p.m. we were finishing and they were transferring the card from the camera and a PA dropped it in the Hudson River. Our whole film was dropped in the Hudson River. And we, it was like, we're done. We were like freaked out. And everyone was amazing. We regrouped. And within the next couple of hours before sunset, we reshot everything that we shot that day. And also had to raise 6,000 extra dollars that afternoon to pay overtime to everybody. But people felt so bad for us. They were like, I just spoke to my grandma. She's going to give you guys $2,000. I mean, people were like ridiculous. And... Um, so it was, it turned out to be the tragedy turned out to be this amazing, 
amazing experience in terms of making this film. Director Matthew Bonifacio and producer Juliana Gilanis Bonifacio attended the awards ceremony as well as the Q&A representing their film Master Maggie, which took home the Audience Choice Award. Master Maggie is just about a celebrity acting coach who one day is interrupted by an unknown actor who wants her to coach him for a Law & Order audition. And any much more, I'll mm -hmm. be spoiling the, the film. All right, tell us what it's like to be a uh, part of the uh, the grand finale here tonight. Oh, it's great. It's just, it's always great to be accepted to, you know, a festival and then to advance to this kind of round, um, just to be amongst other filmmakers and all these talented uh, shorts uh, is a great, is a, is a great feeling. Matthew, why don't you talk about a little bit about, about your film and kind of the challenges of, of, uh, of getting it off the ground? You want to talk about the <laughs> court scene? Um, so I, whoever's seen it, um, there's a, there's a courtroom scene, um, that's kind of like an act two of the film. And that was in particular challenging. We filmed it, uh, um, separately of the rest of the film a couple months later. And we had just intended to film it in Brooklyn in a courthouse. Um, and once we started to inquire about that, we realized that that was going to be way out of our budget because um, to film in New York in a courthouse, it's not the cost of filming there, um, but they require you to have several people who work at the courthouse, like maintenance, sanitation, um, and aid all of these people to be on set, which is understandable, but you have to pay them double overtime because they're working beyond their normal hours. So we realized that this was out of our budget and anywhere we, we were going to film in a government building in New York was going to be the same. So we started to brainstorm where could we still keep our crew local um, that wasn't in the city of New York. So we, um, looked into Hoboken, New Jersey, which anyone who lives in New York knows you can still get there by public transportation. Um, and they had one courthouse that did not allow filming. Um, they hadn't had anything filmed there since on the waterfront. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know what year that was, but yeah. obviously a long time ago. Um, and we got in touch uh, with people there. They said, we don't really allow that, but you can send the script. We sent the script and Less than a day later, Matthew got a call from their head judge. <laughs> and he's like, Matthew, I read your script. Uh, so I don't, I don't normally allow this, but you can film at the courthouse as long as you don't advertise the courthouse in the film, because we don't want to look like we're promoting what happens in the film, <laughs> which we don't want to give away. <laughs> and, um, and we were like, okay. Um, and so then we went through, I mean, of course there's still steps working with them, but everybody was really, honestly, really wonderful. And, um, we, we pulled it off. So the, the courtroom was filmed in one day. And super cheap. <laughs> How was it working with these actors? You got some pretty well-known established actors. Can you talk about the, the process working with them? If you've seen Master Maggie, you need a certain amount of celebrities in it because she's a celebrity private acting coach. Um, we were big fans of Lorraine Bracco. We thought that she would be a great acting teacher um, and just had sent the script, you know, reached out to her manager, well, her manager's assistant, and then it got through the assistant, it got to the manager, then it got to Lorraine, and then they wanted to set up a meeting and watch some of our past work, and, and Lorraine was on board. And then we were like, well, you know, we wrote a couple of other roles for Keenan Thompson didn't didn't know him or anything, and we reached out to his reps and the same thing. He responded to the material and wanted a phone call. Um, and then the late Brian Dennehy, um, he responded to the material and wanted a phone call. And we just got very lucky, um, and they were, you know, lovely to work with. Lorraine actually wanted to rehearse. She asked for rehearsals, and we were like, great, you know, because it's essentially like a one act play. And we didn't shoot it that way, but there was a lot of dialogue and, but it takes place mostly at one location. And she was all game for it and, and down. And we rehearsed for two, for two days uh, with just Lorraine and our lead um, unknown actor, Neil Jane. Um, every, everything else we, we didn't rehearse.
Laura Hemingway and Gabrielle Muller also attended the award ceremony where they took home the award for Best Feature for their film Crossroads of America. At the Q&A, I asked them about the film and some of the challenges in getting it made. The film is about a young woman who has to move back in with her estranged family after a tragic accident. Um, and in so doing has to confront the buried family secret that tore them apart. It's uh, a melodrama, there's surreal elements to it. It's super raw, it's gritty, it's dark. Um, it has a sense of humor that we stand behind. And um, we're super honored to be here. We thank you so much, Jeff, and to, to Catra Film Series for the love and can't wait to check out all of your films. Tell us about like some of the challenges of making your movie and uh, maybe a little bit uh, about kind of navigating the, uh, the film festival market right now. I would say the biggest challenge for us um, was post-production. We filmed everything in 10 days in Indianapolis um, in 2015 and we're post-production for, for a long time. Um, for just various reasons, we just wanted it to be perfect. Um, but generally, I mean, for it was the first feature film for most of us um, and on um, on set, um, except for Kate Catherine. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I mean, for our first feature, I, I mean, it was a really amazing experience. All right, I'm going to go around uh, first uh, from Gabrielle and Laura. Where can we find more about you and your film on the web? Um, we're on the web, um, xroadsusafilm.com and xroadsusafilm on Instagram. Um, and then my personal um, website is gabriellemuller.com. My personal website is laurashemingway.com. I am on IMDb and um, my Twitter is uh, jthomasgray, um, G-R-A-Y. I am chancemulek.com and Twitter is at Chance Mulek. It's a weird name, so I get to own both of those. <laughs> Film is whitingmovie.com. Uh, Instagram is Cuyo, C-U-Y-O Productions. And mine, um, Instagram, Shelly Rowe and three L's because I had the two L one and I lost it. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and you can just check out our website, mastermaggie.com. It's called Instagram and Facebook. It's Lamento. It's Lament with an O underline film. Uh, and you can find me in uh, IMDb in Diego Lopez too. JulianCSantos.com is my website. And then on Facebook, you can check out City Bear Media. Bears in like a bear, not like the other type of bear. Um, and in terms of other projects, well, we have a feature film on Amazon called The Last Christmas Party got picked up for distribution. So feel free to check that out if you like our work. Um, and other than that, that um, we're working on a proof of concept trailer for a horror feature, like some weird kind of 60s period piece. Yeah, yeah, so I'm on Instagram and Twitter, uh, Trust Lex, my last name, first name. Uh, and then also my Vimeo page, um, Zarina is live on there and I have other work on there too as well. Um, uh, is that Vimeo backslash Trust Lex. Instagram is official man overboard and man is two N's, M-A-N-N -N, overboard. Facebook is man overboard. And then if anyone, we have a, a really fun futuristic virtual reality thriller, like a black mirror type of project, if anyone, knows anyone looking for something like that, please reach out. We're very excited about it. So that's my little plug. To know more about the Katra Film Series and its sister festivals, visit their website, katrafilmseries.com, and follow them at Katra Film Series on social media. And that's all we got for you today. Thanks so much for taking this trip down the rabbit hole. For more film festival coverage, including interviews with festival founders, filmmakers, as well as our movie reviews, visit our website, norestfortheweekendpodcast.com. Don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. And now you can follow us at No Rest for the Weekend on Instagram. I'd like to thank Joffrey Guerrero and all the filmmakers who attended this year's grand finale, as well as our sponsor, JMR Rentals. For Behind the Rabbit Productions, I'm Jason Godby. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.